Hey! Hey guys! Hello, welcome! Uh, my name is Pieros. My name is Nikos. And, uh, yeah, when I talk about Sadnox, so uh, the idea for today was to have a more practical overview of the network part and the whole observations workflow. And we have a more detailed and high level presentation tomorrow at the Clark. Uh, all about Sadnox if you want to join us. Uh, so how many have you heard about Sadnox before? Yay. Okay, that's good. Uh, yeah, I mean, the, the title here pretty much says everything. It's uh, The idea is to create a crowdsourced, uh, a crowdsourced distributed network of satellite ground stations and through that crowdsource the, the very uh, thing of scheduling observations. Uh, the project has uh, several uh, parts, it's pretty modular, so uh, we start from the, I mean, the whole workflow starts from the DB actually, uh, the Sadnox DB, which is uh, a project we started pretty much when we started the whole project, and the idea is that we didn't have, a, there wasn't one uh, holistic approach for satellite uh, data, uh, specifically uh, frequencies, mostly frequencies. Uh, so we had some data, public data for satellites for vari from various blogs and websites and so on, but there was not one place to have everything. And in a way that it's also uh, machine readable through an API or something like that. So we created DB, which is uh, uh, all the information there is crowdsourced. So you can, even you, if you have information about satellites, you can go and uh, do suggestions and there's a a big team of volunteers that uh, moderate the suggestions and uh, approve uh, approve the suggestions. Uh, so we have around 200 to 300 satellites with data frequencies mostly, uh, transmitted uh, frequencies, so on. And uh, the reason we also created that is because we needed that in order to create the the rest of the the rest of the Sadnox uh, observation workflow, so we needed that information, especially the frequencies, in order to uh, inform the network part of Sadnox and the ground station, so they know what they actually want to, uh, what frequency they want to uh, to listen to satellites. Yeah, this is an example of uh, of a satellite. So everything you see here is uh, information that has been crowdsourced, crowdsourced by contributors. The, that specific one, Cladis, has two transmitters. We have a photo. We have a real-time uh, uh, orbit uh, data for these specific satellites uh, from the TLEs. And the B.sadnox uh, also has an API, which is public, and everything is uh, in a open data mindset. Everything is Creative Commons. So, uh, for instance, I, I guess you all know Gpredict. Gpredict actually. Uh, is using the uh, the transmitters endpoint to when you choose to fetch data from the network, it actually uses that endpoint to fetch all the transmitters and frequencies for uh, for the satellites. Uh, so if we go back to the no, oh, yeah, yeah, and also uh, another part of DB is that. Uh, uh, since it's a central place uh, that we use as a single source of truth for satellites, we also started uh, uh, pulling back uh, decoded data for telemetry data for satellites. And this is the statistics page, so here you can see uh, how many different type of transmitters we have, how many satellites, so it's, it's 370 uh, transmitters, 220 satellites, and so on. And you can see how many telemetry data we have per satellite. And this is the contributors that actually have uh, do the observations and push the data. So we have an attribution back to the to the observer. Yeah, so through the ape, yeah, a lot. <laughs> yeah, some pagination here. <laughs> uh, so since we have the API with all that data. Uh, that API is also used by uh, by network. Network it's a website that actually orchestrates the whole observation part of Sadnox. Uh, this is the homepage where you can see 
uh, location of uh, all the stations, all the ground stations we currently have on production that are uh, operating and functional and so on. We have much more that are still on development stage and soon to be on on production, hopefully. Yeah, that's the development uh, instance of the network and you can see that we have uh, many more even in Slavbad. And I think there's one in Australia too, uh, three Australia. Yeah. So the, the network is start to, to expanding more and more. And the network is using uh, the API uh, to uh, to have all the information about the satellites and and uh, help the observers or the satellite operators to actually schedule observation uh, to any ground station around the world, not just their ground station, but also other people's ground stations. Uh, do you want to uh, showcase some? Um, so, as, as we said, is this working? Yes, it is. So, as we said, uh, we have the information on the database, so db.satnox.org, and then the network is actually relying on this information to start doing observations. So I'm going to walk you through a typical process for an observer, like how, if I'm an observer and I have a ground station, how can I go in, schedule, see the results of the satellite, and what can I do with them, right? Um, so let's start uh, by checking the list of the ground stations. Um, and if I click in here and the network responds, pretty busy network today and yesterday. That too. Yeah, yeah <laughs> that's, that's part of the issue. We had to grow actually our servers considerably in the, over the um, past couple of months for that reason. Yeah. Did I click it or not? You I should have. You could go to observations in the meantime, you already have that open, I guess. Yeah, the observation seems to work fine. Let's click on the stations. Yeah, we can we can start with the observation. So um, this is the master list uh, master list of observations, which is basically um, just a log of all the different things that happened. And for each for each observation, what you can see is the well the unique identifier of the observation, which is a, a ascending number, and we crossed the 50,000 observations per satellite. Then which satellite uh, was targeted, uh, at which frequency, which encoding uh, we were supposed to listen from that satellite, uh, the time frame, so the start and the end of the observation, uh, any results that uh, were returned, um, who did the observation and in which station. Um, and basically, the color coding that we have here uh, signifies the, the, the status of the observation. So if it's blue, it's a scheduled one. It's one that's going to happen in the future. But if I, f if I filter out the future observations which don't yet have results, and I say that I don't want the future observations, then the results should be only past ones with the results that they have. Pretty slow right now. Okay, cool. So here you can see different observations that uh, were returned. The orange ones means that uh, they need vetting, like they need to someone to go in and check whether there has been a satellite or not. Uh, the green ones have been already vetted uh, as that they successfully had the satellite, and we do this also automatically, not only manually, by checking if there was a decoded payload from the satellite. So we have different kinds um, of decoding flow graphs on GNU radio. Um, right now we support um, FSK 9600, AFSK 1200, and um, CW, APT uh, for NOAA uh, weather imaging transmissions. So whenever there is a, a successful payload decoded, then that's automatically green because we know that we actually picked up a satellite. Uh, for the other cases, uh, for now, we have to go in and check whether the satellite was there. And we're going to see uh, you know, the, the results and how this looks like. So for example, uh, let's go from for this observation. That's a Chinese uh, radio amateur uh, satellite XW2A. Uh, we're supposed to listen it uh, on a two meter uh, band. Unfortunately, the Chinese are actually using this part of the band, which for the rest of the world, especially in Europe, is used for uh, repeaters, um, like local terrestrial repeaters. 
so much for the ITU coordination, by the way, but yeah. Um, and in some cases, we get interferences from uh, local stations, but uh, we should check and, and, and see what happened here. Yeah, so I can see more uh, more um, metadata about the observation itself. And then the results are basically three different things. Uh, the one is a waterfall, which is a typical FFT against time, uh, color-coded with the noise uh, figure, uh, the signal strength basically on, uh, on a specific frequency. So on the y-axis, you would see the time. On the x-axis, you can see the frequency. Uh, we are Doppler correcting, Doppler shifting correcting on this one. So whatever you see as something that is going, you know, back and forth, this is basically a terrestrial, you know, ground transmission because we are already compensating for for Doppler. Uh, but if you see something which is a straight line, then that should be a satellite. And in this case, you can see it here, like really faint, but still, like we we saw that this is an active satellite, right? Uh, so I can go ahead and uh, and mark this observation as a good one. And uh, that's going to be affecting the um, status that we have of the satellite. And we have some, um, um, basically, if you click on the satellite, uh, you can see the success rate of the satellite for previous observations and you know, guess whether it's going to be successful on a, on a next pass, uh, also depending on which station has heard it, which antennas, and you know, those kind of things. Uh, so the, the one part of the result which we always get is a waterfall, right? And that's pretty straightforward, and it's encoding agnostic. Like, we don't care about the encoding itself. And then we have the audio part of the, uh, of the transmission. And for this, uh, we are um, decoding audio, demodulating audio, basically, uh, based on uh, our best guess for the encoding itself. So if it's a CW, it goes through a narrow filter and tries to find like the um, uh, CW transmission in there. If it's a um, FSK transmission, then it's a wider FM uh, audio decoding. And we supply those uh, downloadable for people so that if someone wants to do their own analysis and decode them themselves, they can download the audio uh, and, and do that themselves. Uh, and in case something was picked up, you would see that here on data. So let's try to find an observation that this also has uh, decoded, decoded data and uh, see how this how this went. Uh, yes. Uh, that's only one station every measurement. Can you also do measurements across several stations? Uh, concurrently, you mean? No, no, like, like tracing a satellite across several stations. Yeah, right, right now we don't have a way to do a single observation for multiple ground stations, if that's what you're asking. Yeah, so right now we don't do that. It's like one per station. Because, well, there are a couple of reasons. Uh, the, the one is that, well, software re you know, related one, which is much more difficult, and we need to do that. That's, that's the obvious one. But it's also that the density of the network right now would not be suffice, like it would not be enough to, you know, to, to have concurrent passes. Um, it would have to be really specific, like if it goes from UK to Greece, that we have multiple stations, yes, and then within US, like Eastern and Western, yes. But other parts of the world would be, you know, uh, missing basically um, so again if I filter out uh, the future ones and go to something which is more successful in terms of decoding um, okay yeah so that must be much nicer So this is a uh, English ground station. This is a Greek observer, and that's Bagsat One, um, a satellite that has a FSK9600 AX25 beacon, uh, and you can see the the beacons clearly uh, on the on the waterfall. Uh, and if you click on the data, then you can see the raw hex payloads that we got from that satellite, right? And the the concept of the network is to to be agnostic of the payload um, uh, internals. So we just do the demodulation, and then we end up with um, the raw bytes itself. And then we push everything that we have on db.satnox.org, where it sits with the other millions of packets. And then the, the next project uh, for us would be on db.satnox.org to go in a satellite and see things that are decoded. So for example, for a, a telemetry transmission like this, um, each satellite pretty much uses their own you know, encoding scheme on top of uh, AX25. So you would, you would see here that probably the fourth byte here would be the temperature and the 16th byte would be the 
you know, magnetometer reading on something, but this is specific to the satellite itself, right? And uh, we figured that we should stay on the network side of things, we should stay on the raw type of data, and then feed it on a central place that is fitted with other uh, payload feeds, and have the satellite teams work with us uh, and do the decoding so that we can see the, you know, like graphs and uh, all the different data per satellite, uh, which is a much more involved work, and it's uh, super specific to its satellite. So. Uh, we would rather stay, you know, as agnostic as possible on the network side of things. Um, so, yeah, those would be the, the transmissions. And they also have a, um, a timestamp uh, over there for its uh, transmission, which is pretty useful if you want to do things like um, basically graphs of where the data was picked up per ground station. So one thing that we did recently, I think it's worth showing. Um, let me do that here. Oops. Uh. Give me a sec. Uh. Yeah, so this one. So what this is, is uh, one of our ground stations. And all the different dots that you can see here are basically decoded payloads. Uh, and what we did here uh, was the reverse way around. Because we know the timestamp and we know the Keplerian elements, like the orbital data for the satellite itself, and the position of the ground station, we could extrapolate where exactly this payload was decoded, basically. And then if we plot those, uh, we can see where the successes are happening per ground station. So this is basically giving us a, a sense of you know, where the station is working correctly. And this is due to, obviously, you know, like obstacles on the horizon, or uh, problems with tracking, or you know, like if you have a building next to you, or something is happening on one side or another. This specific ground station actually has two really large buildings here and here. Um, so we can clearly see that it's not going to be decoding any packets uh, on that. Um, and we're going to be automating that also on the network so that the observers uh, know where they should you know, get some, some, trans some transmissions. Um, so yeah, let's walk through the life of an observer. So first thing you do is basically you come to the available ground stations. So this is the ground stations list. And uh, with green, you can see the ground stations that are uh, available right now for observations. Um, and how we know that is that basically each ground station has its own uh, client code, uh, which is a Python instrumentation that we have running locally. And it's uh, constantly pinging the network, right? So it's a kind of like a pool type of architecture, um, because we couldn't push to the clients unless there was a network. You know, you have to bypass nuts and everything. Um, so we figured you know, that the client should always pull from the network. So whenever the client checks, uh, if do I have a job? Do I have a job, right, from, uh, from the network? Uh, then we, uh, we make sure that we note it so that we know it's online. And when was the last time that it checked with us? Um, so those are the different ground stations. You can see the location of the ground stations, how many things they had in total, how many observations they had in total in the past, uh, and what has been the success rate for uh, those observations. Uh, and then whether they have uh, future observations scheduled on them. So if you are an observer and you see something like for the next day, like this 23 ground station actually has 50 observations scheduled, you know it's pretty full. Like you're not going to get any windows you know, uh, uh, in there. Uh, and then what kind of antennas and who's the owner of the ground station. So let's try to find a, a ground station which is empty. Let's say the hikerspace one. That's our first ground station on top of the hikerspace in Athens where it all started. Um, and you can see more uh, information about the ground station, the location of it, like a photo of the actual setup. Uh, and then you're waiting for the pass predictions to, to be loaded from the network. And once the pass predictions, here, the oh yeah, the last scene, like when it was the last time that it actually pinged the network so that you know it's alive, right? So this is a, a timeline of all the different satellites that are going to be passing uh, above this uh, ground station. And the way it works is that you have the, the name of the satellite, the success rate of the satellite, so that you know whether it's been successful in the past or not. So, for example, for Oscar 7, which is a super old radio amateur satellite, but it also has a short wave uh, transponder on it, which is 
interesting. Uh, we've been almost 50-50, more on the you know failed side. So I'm not going to favor it unless I actually wanted to, 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 to do an observation and check if it's available again. Then the time frame, you know, when it starts crossing the horizon and then when it, uh, when it sets, uh, that's uh, the, the data for the pass itself. So here would be the azimuth of rise, that would be the max elevation, and that's going to be the azimuth for set, like when it, where it crosses the horizon again. A polar plot so you can, you know, visually quickly see uh, how the pass satellite is going to be uh, operating. Um, and then a, a button to, to schedule this observation. So let's try to find one observation that uh, it's going to be producing some interesting results. So, okay, here I have uh, iTubesat, uh, 41 degrees, but I know that this ground station is actually cool uh, on 41 degrees in these azimuths. Uh, and if I click on schedule, then a new window opens. And in here, the Satellite itself is pre-selected. The time frame is pre-selected because it's based on the predictions that we did on the ground station. Uh, and in here, I can I, I can choose different transmitters. So different satellites have multiple transmitters, and this information is coming from db.satnox.org, basically. Uh, and I can check, you know, the the frequency that it's going to be using and the encodings and everything. Uh, I'm going to be using the drifted one because we we've seen that. Many, many times, actually most of the times, the satellites have an advertised frequency, and then when they go up in space, the oscillator drifts, and you know, there are other thermal events, or something happens, and they drift slightly you know, to the left or right. Uh, well, basically through observations. So we, we start the observations, uh, and then we adjust from based on, on, on what we see. Um, uh, it's going to be an interesting project to do that automatically, actually. Like try to find you know what's the drift and then submit it on the on the database. So in this case, I'm going to use this third one. I can also check uh, when was the last time that the two-line element, like the orbital information for the satellite, uh, was issued. Uh, so this was issued a day and an hour ago, which is not that long ago. Like the TLS don't change that much within a day, so it's you know like recent enough. Uh, and if I do the calculation. Then it's going to say that hackerspace one is available throughout this time. So do you want to schedule this? Like actually uh, commit on doing that. And then I click on schedule, and that becomes a pending scheduled observation. And I wait here for the results to uh, to come back. It's uh, the question was uh, whether it's first serve first come. Uh, yes, it is. So the first that comes, it's, uh, it's going to be the, the one that um, does that. There are cases that you can override things. So um, basically, we're working right now on a permission model uh, so that the ground station owners have more priority uh, on, over their own ground station uh, than others, and they can override uh, observations. And we also have a, a group of moderators, which is basically people that can override pretty much everything. They can delete observations, and of course, in collaboration and communication with uh, ground station owners. Uh, and that happens a lot only in cases that we have new satellites, right? So when we're hunting new satellites, we have a new launch from ISS or a new rocket launch or something, and we are, you know, like really trying to see whether the satellite worked, whether the frequency is correct, you know, whether, well, it worked it by itself is, you know, huge enough for the teams of the satellites, right? So in this case, we just make sure that everyone knows that we're going to be, you know, prioritizing those, and there is a sort of a operation center coming uh, in an IRC uh, channel and trying to coordinate the observations, who has the first pass, who's going to do the second, and those kind of things. Um, so, yeah, so... Yeah, we're not going to be waiting now. Uh, this is UTC time. That's two hours ahead of us right now. So, yeah, in two hours' time, if you come he back here, you're going to see the result. Uh, and because it's iTubesat and on hackerspace, it's going to be pretty successful, actually. And we're going to see the, uh, the waterfall. Unless the satellite fails by that time, highly doubt it. Um, so, yeah, so if I'm an observer, uh, this is the way that I go through and, uh, and do, you know, all sorts of... Uh, scheduling basically and then uh, every you know day or so or whenever i have time i would come back to the observations and check for things that need vetting right um so if i click on i don't want the future ones come on yeah Let's go through the different colors here. So those are the future ones. Those are the good ones that we vetted or automatically vetted that the actual satellite was heard. 
The red ones are the ones that the satellite was not heard, so probably something wrong with the satellite. The orange ones are the ones that need vetting, that we need to vote on. And then we have the black ones, which are the failed ones. And this is the difference between the black and the red is that on red, the satellite failed. On black, the client, the ground station itself failed. And we know that if it's not returning any results or if it's like super noisy waterfall and there's something wrong with the coaxial cable or something wrong with the antenna, and we just mark them as failed so that you know the ground station owners know that there is something wrong with the uh, station itself rather than the satellite, right? Like those are two completely different things. Um, so if I go in here, I would search for different things that are uh, basically orange, uh, observations and uh, opening them up I will try to see well clearly there is a satellite here so this should be marked as good so I'm marking it as good uh, let's check another one okay that's an interesting again Chinese satellite um, XWTC um, and you can see again this is a part of the um, local transponders, like the local um, uh, repeaters uh, band in US and, uh, and Europe. Uh, and you can see some interference from, uh, from those. Uh, and XW satellites also have uh, multiple different uh, transmitters really close to another. So there is a CW beacon that is happening on the center, and then you have a whole part of the spectrum which is dedicated for transporting. So basically a repeater in space, like you transport up, like you're uplink something and then it you know, transport this back. That's why you can see slight movements in here. This is basically people trying to do manually do Doppler shifting and keeping themselves within the satellite itself. This is a linear transponder uh, with a quite wide range so that wherever you actually uplink in there, the satellite does the same thing on a different band. Um, and then uh, you'd have other transmissions like data transmissions from the satellite or local noise i think that this is actually local noise rather than transmission from the uh, satellite itself um yeah this is clearly a satellite so i'm gonna mark it as good and then another one yeah so this you can faintly see the satellite beacons here. And it's useful to, to get an eye for those kind of things. Basically, by checking by what kind of transmissions are you, are you, you know, waiting for it to see. If it was CW, it would wait to see like a clear line, like intermittent line, right? Uh, BPSKs, especially like narrow BPSKs, it's just, you know, those kind of small lines that you, uh, that you see here. Uh, the other lines that are going, uh, all the way around is basically local interference noise. Uh, and that might not be, in this case, uh, those are probably from the power supply uh, itself. So it's an EMI from the uh, power supply. Um, and then uh, type of interferences from other stations or beacons are visible by being inter intermittent. So you would not see them as continuous as EMI from a power supply, right? So in this case, this ground station, which is in southern Greece, should check their power supply and try to, you know, eliminate the, the noise issue. Again, though, this is a good one because we can clearly see that the satellite was active. So yeah, that's the life of, a, of an observer. Once this, um, we, are, we are right now constantly adding new, um, well, ground stations, obviously, like trying to expand as much as possible. Uh, but the most crucial thing for us is to, to expand the decoders on GNU radio. So if any of you, like, is, you know, um, active on GNU radio coding, uh, that's a tremendous amount of opportunity in um, all the different things that we have. And the test bed that we use is ba basically oral different, or, or uh, all our different ground stations. So it's easy for us to, to push new flow graphs and then have the clients actually test the results of those uh, flow graphs on GNU radio and get the results back so that we can expand uh, and target more encodings, especially BPSKs, uh, GMSKs. Uh, those are the things that we haven't done uh, yet. Uh, we are pretty okay on FSK and CW and uh, APT. Uh, I should show some APT here uh, because it's interesting. Let's go through here. Try to find a weather satellite, some NOAA ones would be nice. Those are the US uh, amateur, uh, sorry, not amateur, uh, meteorological uh, satellites. So if I go in here and then here, 
Uh, it's going to be a faint one. Uh, you can see the APT transmission for those of you that recognize it. Uh, and that's not going to be, you know, perfect, but still you can see the decoding of the uh, weather image automatically uh, in here. Uh, in other cases, like this one, much nicer. Um, yeah, and here you can see a decoding of, uh, of the weather satellite. I think that that's England. Yeah, this, this uh, station is on Denmark, so that's probably Northern Europe. But with so much clouds, you know, it's not always easy to detect what's, uh, what you're seeing. Um, so, um, yeah, that's the, the, the flow, basically. Um, Nikos, do you want to add anything to the flow? Uh, no, I guess also there's the, the option to, I don't know if you want to show it, from the observation point of view, you can choose a satellite and then see which ground stations are available. Oh, okay. So yeah, the other way around, instead of going to, instead of going through a ground station and see what satellites are from the ground station, you can go from a satellite and see where it's available uh, in which ground stations. So if I click here on new observation, I can select, let's say, the UK Cube 1 uh, on this frequency, that's fine. For the next, let's say, hour or so, or a couple of hours. And if I click on calculate, Yeah, it's going to tell me that those different ground stations have those available windows uh, of observations. And I can click on schedule and schedule all of them at the same time. Uh, although this is not necessarily advisable, especially because there are things like, you know, uh, those kind of things. We're working on a solution to deselect, you know, just click on, yes, I want this, this and that. Just schedule them. Yeah. Um, at the moment, we calculate the uh, overlaps and we exclude overlapped observation window so for instance you can see that's actually a bug it shouldn't be here but you see that these two stations have no observation windows because they have overlapped with other observations already so they shouldn't even be there and, and that's pretty useful for uh, uh, post leop like post launch operations uh, so that we can quickly check for all the network for the next day you know who's going to be available to do what uh, and then quickly, you know, schedule them uh, in in bulk. Yeah. So, any questions so far? Yeah. I have more. So, what is your target audience? I mean, who, who's gonna observe? Uh, I, I mean, I, mean, I see everybody can observe now, right? Well, the the question is, um, uh, who is the target audience, and if anybody can can observe? So I'm going to start with the latter uh, part, which is the who can observe here. Uh, basically, the permission model that we have right now is that in order to get access to the network, um, you can create an account. That's fine. Uh, but unless you have a ground station, you are not able to schedule on other ground stations. And the, the concept there is an incentive to grow the network. Um, we're not charging, obviously, for anything. We're not like this is a non-profit volunteer-run operation, right? Um, but the, the concept would be that we can invite and incentivize more people to have ground stations, and then you get access to the whole network, like the others are going to get access to your uh, to your ground station. So that's the permission. Uh, then, regarding the audience itself, I would say we started with radio amateurs, like because well they have the antennas they have some rotators they know their way around things right uh, but quickly especially as we moved uh, initially we were also supporting the hardware radios uh, so audio you know output from old you know hardware actual radios and then it was quickly you know obvious that sdr is the way to go for many different reasons um, so when we move to the SDR side of things, then more and more people that are doing things like um, SDR hacking, not necessarily on the amateur, not even satellites, right? Uh, it was more nice for them to get to work with something which is GNU radio specific, so expanding more outside the radio amateur uh, type of typical crowd. And then uh, a super specific group that is using the satellite network is the actual satellite operators. So a university team that is putting up a CubeSat, they're adding a ground station on the network and they're using other, you know, ground stations around the world. But this is specific to, to the satellite itself, right?
Any? <laughs> yeah, go ahead. I've seen uh, something like 280 satellites in your database. But I think there are more than 20,000, or I don't know. Um, yeah. I mean, it's UX10. Um, um, but is there a way to crawl them somehow? Just from, I mean, it would be pretty hard to find by hand every 20,000 of the satellites. Yeah, so. Okay, numbers, numbers and satellites. Okay, cool. So we have 20, 220 satellites that we were able to track, right? And the operational satellites out there are not 20,000. Actually, there are 6,000. Okay. Yeah, there are many debris and, you know, the, um, like decommissioned satellites and everything else. So what's the difference between the 200 that we track and the 6,000 that are out there, right? Uh, well, a considerable amount of the 6,000, uh, it's never going to publish their frequencies. Uh, we're talking about you know, even scientific ones that are not open to, to the public or military ones or, you know, things that are not documented or are old and everything else. And that might be actually, you know, almost half of those, like really many of them. Uh, then even that, how you go from 200 to 3000, if you say that it's half, um, basically the, the question is a question of crowdsourcing. Like we are constantly reaching out to as many teams as possible, trying to provide them with, uh, provide us with their frequencies so we can use them. Uh, and there are two restrictions there. The one is which bands they're using. Many of them are not using radio amateur bands, which are open for if you have an amateur uh, license. Um, most CubeSats do. That's why you know, most of the satellites that we track are CubeSats. But many of them, so for example, uh, let's take uh, the Sentinel, um, um, the Sentinel uh, meteorological uh, Earth observing satellites from uh, the European Space uh, Agency. So it's a bunch of them right now up, like 10 of them or something, um, in various different phases. And the frequencies they use uh, for downlinking and everything else, like even though we know them, we don't know what encoding they use necessarily. They change it all the time. The packet framing is not open. Like even if you know the frequency and you can see the carrier, and even if you have the antennas and the equipment to receive them, because those, most of them are actually in 5Gs and 10Gs and you know, X-band and KA, KU-band. Um, and it's totally possible to do that with the SATNOX in terms of instrumentation, like the software and everything else. Um, but the problem would be that you wouldn't, you wouldn't know what to do with the data in any case. Like the framing that they have and everything else like is probably either encoded or completely undocumented and they're not willing to actually share this kind of thing. Um, and this goes back to the, you know, we need, we need as much help as possible to, to try to make these groups pressured enough to actually publish the results of their satellites, especially if it's publicly funded satellites, like ESA satellites for Earth observing. You know, we, assuming that we are all from Europe, we paid for those, right? And there's a, also a political and a, a ethical, you know, uh, issue about sending something up, not knowing the frequency, not knowing how it's used, keeping them think uh, things you know closed source. Like I would be okay even by documenting them, so let alone having open source code to so actually so decode them. That's yeah? yeah, yeah, and then that's ha that happens a lot, unfortunately. Okay. Yeah, yeah, that's 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 true actually. So whenever uh, in in many jurisdictions, even within, within Europe too, uh, reception of specific signals outside your license, like if you are a radio amateur or outside uh, ISM bands, which well we can all use for reception, um, then that's illegal by itself. So that that's also a local issue that we we're working together with the ground stations uh, locally. Um, yeah, there's no easy way around it, uh, basically, unless, you know, there is a major move which not only talks about satellites, but generally about RF, uh, RF spectrum um, and trying to harmonize uh, the um, legislation around that so that we can at least, you know, l listen to things, let alone transmit uh, on, different, on different bands. Yeah, so anecdotally, we don't have hard stats from that, right? But everything that uses radio amateur bands, in theory, 
is obliged to be open and not encrypted. That's due to global radio amateur legislation. I mean, thankfully, that that's the case. Some people are actually violating this, and on top of radio amateur bans, they're transmitting en encrypted content. Um, there's a process to actually file a you know appeal to IT ITU about this, but there's little you can do if you put up the satellite, you know, and it's already up there, and they they're gonna be saying, well, it's up there, go and get it, right? The problem <laughs> the problem arises. Uh, sorry for the tangent, but um, I want to address this. The problem arises when whenever you try to assign, uh, we actually flew a satellite ourselves. It's up up there, uh, and we've been through the process, so we know the process of you know ITU filing for a frequency and get the assignment and everything else. If you see the, the way that you get your, your frequency assigned, it's uh, rubbish. Like it's, it's basically you say what type of satellite you're going to be flying, around which frequency you would, you would want to use, and there's going to be a negotiation around that. But they're not asking you about anything else. They ask you for the encoding, that's fine. But then they don't tell you that it should be open and it should be, and they're not verified. Whenever you deliver your satellite, we delivered the satellite in. Um, in, in um, the checkout we did on uh, Netherlands, right? Um, and when we delivered the satellite, no one checked that we actually used this frequency or used this encoding or this is decodable. They couldn't, like, I, ca I could have done anything I wanted. It would still go in space and then I would be, well, it's in space. Go figure, right? And people actually do that. Like, yeah, they do that. Like, uh, and that's, that's bad. So that's the, the one side of thing. Then for the... Um, the other side, which is if it's outside the radio amateur, actually the vast majority. Yeah, Pe people are excited about satellites. That's nice. That's nice. Um, so the vast majority of the of the vast majority of the satellites uh, that are operating outside the radio amateur uh, transmissions are actually using encrypted uh, communications. So, and it can be scrambled communications but it can be actual encrypted uh, you know communications so yeah the scrambling is fine as, as long as you know the polyonym and everything else to descramble it right uh, but the encryption is you know off the case and of course you have to consider many satellites that are used for uh, um, you know dvbs transmissions like a geosynchronous uh, audio visual type of transmissions that we, that we have digital transmissions all of them uh, all of them are well, the majority of them are encrypted right now o on many different levels, not, on, on, not only on the you know, network level, on the application level of the transmission and, uh, and everything else. So. Yeah, you no chance of s seeing, uh, yeah, unless it actually shows up or you know what you're looking for. You have no way, but, but this is the same thing with the rest of the transmissions, right? So different legislations have different kind of rules around the world about where you can listen, right? There is no way around it. The, the, the actuality of the situation is that as long as you're receiving, there is a plausible deniability about who received what from where, because you're receiving, right? This is not the legal way to go about it, obviously, um, but this is what actually happens not, not only for satellite, you know, uh, signal interception, but also for terrestrial interception. Uh, you're, you're listening. There's no way for, for someone to know w whether you're listening or not. Um, the weird thing is that for our own transmissions, this is actually online with an API and everything. So if someone wants to know who is listening to what, that's actually up there and it's pretty easy. So we have to be much more careful to not um, jeopardize the operation and put people at risk on their own uh, jurisdictions. So, and, uh, and there, is, there is a way to do that actually. So whenever you, uh, you say which antenna you have, and that's only selectable by the, yeah, so that's only selectable by the ground station uh, owner. Uh, so the antenna that you input 
right here, you say what type of antenna, which band, okay, and then you you specify a frequency um, um, a frequency range. So if that's legal in your country, you should be fine. Like the network cannot override this um, this frequency. So I cannot say that uh, hackerspace GR ground station should listen to. 148 or 156, right? Because it's that's out of range in any case. So, so yeah, at least that's that's a bare minimum, you know, restriction so that we can be legal on on different countries and not pe put people at risk. Not right now, mainly because. Mainly because our API is open. We see some heavy traffic on an API. Uh, we would like to check, you know, we'd, we don't want to check logs for IPs and things like that. That's bad practice for privacy reasons. But if we see excessive load on the API, you know, I think that we should crack down what's happening. Well, the question is that if we've seen satellites that are transmitting things that we were not expecting. The question is yes, but not why you might think. Um, uh, what, most of the times, unfortunately, what happens is this. There is a university team that is putting up a CubeSat. Cool. The project goes on for five or six years. Different people come and go in the project. Like typical academic research project, right? Like we, all, we almost all have been there, and we wish we'd never been there, but that's, that's a different story. That's a story for tomorrow. Like we're going to be giving a talk about the satellite, and it has parts of it. Um, so basically, people come and go. Documentation, you know, becomes obsolete. You know, things are, you know, not published well. At the end of the day, somehow you manage, like, as a team, to deliver a satellite. Uh, those are different people from the people that started it, and different people from the people that wrote the documentation. Like, you know, all sorts of people. And what we end up having is that the documentation was about a different part of a project that is no longer le relevant and the satellite that goes up you know is published on a blog of a person of the researcher on the PhD student that actually did that probably in a paper somewhere right and that's the majority and the norm uh, for the satellites that we've seen that's why one of the driving reasons of creating db.chatnox.org like a crowdsourced you know centralized approach of where the frequencies are is due to this because we were when we started uh, the network, we were doing that manually. We were going through blogs of people, trying to find information about the, the, the frequency. Most of them were wrong. So yes, many times we find things that we didn't expect. But this is not because they planned it, but th this is because the practice was bad. So that's the... Yeah, so the question is about sponsors and support of the university. So let, let me clarify the scheme uh, of, of Satnox. So Satnox is a project of the Libre Space Foundation. So we have a non-profit foundation that is supporting uh, this. We actually created the Libre Space Foundation in order to support Satnox, like the other way around. Yeah. But we also do other things now, right? Um, so Libre Space Foundation has its own funds, like through targeted development, you know, like research type of grants and those kind of things, and we funnel them to, to Satnox. Um, the support of that we're getting um, specifically, like directly for Satnox, most of the time is actually a ground station itself. So for example, the Tromso University in Oslo, um, like they had a ground station, a group of people wanted to put it on Satnox, they put it on Satnox, right? I, I consider this considerable support, but this is the, most of the times, like what, what, what we're getting. So, yeah. And I think we are on time. Ah, uh, yeah. N Nikos, any final remarks? No, I mean, uh if you want to know, as I said in the beginning, the, the project is pretty modular, so we didn't talk about other stuff of the project, like the ground station itself, the hardware parts, the client parts, and so on. So if you want to hear about that, we have a talk tomorrow at the Clark room, and for the satellite too, there's back-to-back -back talks. So you can join us there, or you can find us on the table right next to this uh, stage. Okay, thank you.